hello everyone welcome to the 40 friday i'm happy to be your moderator for today so today we are going to have a nice conversation with um, a young water professional from denmark and i know you are going to enjoy it so just stay tuned i am jacob amengo i'm from ghana i work with the ghana water company limited as an assistant water quality assurance officer and I'm studying remotely at the University of Calgary. I'm studying a Master of Science in Civil Engineering with specialization in environmental engineering. Thank you and stay tuned for the rest of the interview. So our guest for today's 40 Friday is Dr. Ines Breda. She works as a product and process manager at Sehoko Water, a ground force company she has an industrial PhD and she is passionate about data science and international collaborations. She is also a board member and treasurer of the International Water Association, the Young Water Professionals in Denmark. She is also a board member of the IWA Specialist Group on Design, Operation and Management of Drinking Water Treatment Systems. Welcome, Dr. Ines Breda. Hi, Jacob. And please don't say doctor again. <laughs> Just say Ines, I'm fine with that, Jacob. That is fine. You work Good. for it, so I'll continue uh. saying it. <laughs> 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 okay. So today we are going to have a nice conversation with you for us to for you to give us more insight into your journey in the water industry. So I know that you are originally from Portugal, but now you are living in Denmark. So how did that happen? Uh, well, it's actually <clears throat> a very interesting story because um, I basically had someone who believed in me and offered me an opportunity. Um, I was uh, I finished a master in civil engineering in Portugal and then I did some studies in Denmark and I went back to Portugal and it was very difficult to find a job at that time. Um, I was doing some preparation of kids for exams and things like that, but I couldn't find a job in my field. And then I contacted an old professor from the university uh, here in Denmark and he gave me the opportunity for a job position of three months. and. It was a bit hard at that time because I had around 60 students um, and I was in doubt of what would be the right thing to do. Um, but I decided to grab my things and go for a three month position for a, a water chemistry uh, research group. Um, and that's how everything started. Wow, that's interesting. It's nice to know how you are able to use your network to figure out the challenges that you find yourself in at a particular time so that is really wonderful and um, you did an industrial PhD how different is that from the normal PhD that we know well a an industrial uh, PhD requires a different mindset and um, a bit more I would say resilience towards the translation of knowledge between these two world, worlds. So in an academic PhD, your focus is on academic research. You have fundamental research behind it. Um, you probably spend a lot of time in the lab, in my case, because it was chemistry and bioscience. Um, and when you have the, and when you add the industrial partner, you suddenly have very practical questions or the need of showing that you're uh, hypothesis or your results will work in a full-scale unit and setting. Um, so, so that's the first difference. The second one is that you find yourself uh, reading much more uh, research that is practice, applied research. And there's sometimes uh, difficulties between um, academic uh, journals that uh, have um, academic research behind it or applied research that there are journals that are okay with the, uh, with publishing applied research. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, it came to a point where I could see that there was also a different way that students would get perceived by where they publish. 
uh, published and that that didn't fit well with me so for example i could find some um, industrial PhD students that were having troubles in publishing their research because they couldn't find a good enough journal, they would say, for academic journal that would mm -hmm. accept industrial data. Um, and then on the other side, um, it was more difficult for them sometimes with the industrial partners to publish data that the industrial partner was okay with publishing as well. So there's advantages because you fully immersed in this transition of knowledge, but there's also some challenges with, uh, you have to publish three or four papers before you can get your PhD degree, and it can be challenging to find where to publish. Oh, okay. That, that is nice. So, um, would you recommend a lot of people going to industrial PhD? Yeah, definitely in the water sector. Um, okay. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't know if you had a follow up on that, but it, it, for me, it was clear that um, in the setting that we are today, the need for publishing more applied research is immense. Um, and making uh, journals uh, accessible and open access is also very important. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that, for example, IWA has done a lot, right? So all journals under IWA publishing are now open access. And that means mm -hmm. that me, that now that I'm sitting in a, in a in this industry, I can easily access to the latest research regarding water. And that makes my job easier to translate that knowledge into practice. That is great. So tell me, after studying an industrial PhD, how do you apply it to your work in Eurowater? Yeah, so at Eurowater, I'm sitting as a product and process manager. And so that means that I'm responsible for a technology uh, that includes several products. And then um, I'm responsible to understand how it works, how the sales departments are perceiving it and what they know about it. Um, if service teams have any feedback on the performance of that product. And then, of course, if looking at the horizon or different markets, how should that product be developed? Um, so that means that I have to not only continue to develop this skill of translating knowledge from different people and different groups of people, but also with being very close to what um, what are the current challenges across the globe with water? And what is the latest technology telling me um, so I can apply it directly to the product? Well, that, that sounds like an interesting job. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people would like to do that. So I just advise you to do more of an industrial PhD so that you can have, have nice roles to work in. Yeah. Um, how is your everyday like? My everyday life, well, uh, I wake up around 5.45. Um, now I'm working from home currently, so I actually go for a walk for like half an hour, one hour. And then I start working. I usually like to start around 7. And then I will have half an hour of my day to go through emails. Uh, and then I have no notifications of my email, so that's the time that I have. And then I go through my work, and that can be, for example, checking if any I have any pilot setups running, checking how they are doing, uh, replying to troubleshooting cases, having meetings with cases that are not working or helping design um, some processes. Or um, I'm also pretty involved with, with the young water professionals, so sometimes I also have meetings on that sense on that direction to try to include and expand the network here in Denmark. Um, then, yeah, I will leave work around three, four, four, usually. Uh, and then I'll just enjoy the afternoon with friends um, or dancing or learning a new language. <laughs> now I'm working on my Danish um, and or reading a book. I'm in a book club as well. Um, and then for now also in the engineers without borders and yeah, so all the side projects that come in, you know what it is, Jacob. Um, and then I usually go to bed around, let's say 10, 10.30, 10.30. Wow. 
that is <laughs> that is a nice lineup of activities and I'm, I'm very happy to know that young other professional staff like plays um, um, an important uh, role in your everyday life and I would advise everyone to also do the same because that is the only way that we can make contributions to the water industry as young people. So, well done on that. <laughs> well, I would like to know two fun facts about you that your colleagues don't know. <laughs> uh, my colleagues, uh, my colleagues don't definitely do not know that I dance human salsa. They don't know that and they do not know that i know how to sail they also don't know that that is that is very interesting i think i have to learn some of these things yeah <laughs> do you have like principles or core values that guide your work in the industry I think you touched upon a topic that is very important to me um, and it was one of the reasons why I decided to be in the industry. Um, for me, the core value is responsibility and responsible business uh, in the water sector. And it was difficult. I didn't know if I could find that in the industry. Uh, I don't know. Uh, and when I started to look for jobs here in Denmark, I had meetings with several people from different companies to try to understand how they do business in the water sector. And I have to say that after a couple of conversations with, um, at the time, CEO of my company, of the FD Auto Water, um, it was clear that I could trust how this specific company was doing business. And it was very simple. I just, you know, I, I did very sincere questions without being afraid of what the answer would be. Uh, for example, at that time, and this was beginning of 2019, I questioned their mission statement, the mission statement of the company. And that was because at the time, everyone was talking about the SDGs and a lot of water companies would include the SDG six in their own mission statement. And I asked my, my uh, the, the the CEO at the time, why don't we have that as well? Why don't we showcase ourselves as some as a company that is working towards that goal? And his answer was, well, we were here before the SDGs, and we will be here after the SDGs. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that if you read our mission statement, you can see that we are in alignment with the SDGs. So there's no need to change it. And, and that was very important to me because I felt that there was also a lot of, uh, at that time, I don't know if now it's that frequent, but at that time there were a lot of companies that would showcase them or include the SGZ6 in their mission statements, kind of as a marketing tool, more than uh, a strategy that was embedded in, in the company. And that was actually driving uh, the, the energy and the, um, um, and the plans that, of, that, of the company. So, yeah, I was very happy about that. That's just an example of, um, of one of the ways that you can, you know, understand the company that you're working for. So I could see that the company was responsible and that was my core value and I could trust in it. You know, in the end of the day, we put many hours of work uh, for the company and we are helping the company to progress and, and if we don't believe in it, for me, it's just very difficult to, to spend that time and that energy. And, and I know I'm talking from a privileged position because I know that not everyone has the opportunity to choose who to work for. Uh, I know what it is. I, I was unemployed for many years uh, and, you know, looking for any job that was given to me. But I do think that in those cases, we can also, you know, start to make some change in different ways. That, that is very, very nice. Um, I actually like the fact that um, you were proactive, you asked questions when you didn't understand certain things or you thought they were against your core values. And I think that is what we young professionals need to do. We don't need to be shy. We need to be bold to ask the questions, the difficult questions in order to understand what we are doing so that our contributions can, can come out well. 
because we know that we are not doing something that we don't want to do yeah so that is really nice yes yeah, so you've told us about your work you've told about your fun side you dance and all that so what song would you say will sum you up <clears throat> I think that the song that would sum me up would be Don't Stop Me Now by the Queen. <laughs> that wow. would be my answer. Okay. I think my audience are yearning to hear you sing it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't Stop Me Now by the Queen. Do you, do you know how it starts, Jacob? No, I'm bad with singing. I'm bad with music. Dancing. That was not my question. <laughs> <laughs> you have to sing with me the chorus and then we can make it. Okay. So you just have to say, don't stop me now, and now we'll go for the rest. Don't stop me now. I'm having such a good time. I'm having a ball. Don't stop me now. If you want to have a good time, just give me a call. Don't stop me now. Ah, you know the song. <laughs> Thank so you good. very much, Ines, uh, for this time with you, <laughs> giving us insight into your water journey and then um, telling us the fun side of you so that we know that um, you are not always thinking about water, that you also spend time <laughs> during your leisure, doing other things that make you happy. So thank you very much and thank you, my audience, for staying tuned. And I know that you've learned a lot. Keep staying tuned and then... Um, just watch out for the next 40 Friday interview. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Bye. Thank you, Ines. <laughs>